So let me start with explaining how American educational system works very, very briefly, not getting into the whole education, but covering some basics, uh, some terminology. Then a few words on your choices of universities, how you choose one. And then perhaps more importantly, or most importantly, what is the application process looks like? Uh, what, what does it look like? And basically how to apply to a school and you know what the chances are and things like that. And uh, so let me share here a couple of slides. Um, so, and then we'll uh, talk about these things together. So let me see if I can share my screen and uh, we'll talk about that. So education in North America and by North America here, I mean Canada and the United States because the two systems are relatively simple. There are some differences that I will point out, but generally the process is more or less the same for Canada and the United States with a few minor changes. Uh, so one, let's clarify uh, what a university sort of is, uh, because there is some confusion when it comes to naming these institutions. So in most of the world, uh, people say that they apply to uni university. In the United States, the word college is used often. And so many people are not sure. So what's the difference between college and university? What is it? So in the United States and Canada, um, the word university usually applies to the institution. So that's basically the, you know, all the buildings, all the people. So university, that's, that's the university. College, uh, normally Americans call it, um, uh, normally Americans refer to the first four years of studies for a bachelor's degree as going to college. So like, for example, my university, I'm at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, but the kids who go to this university to get a degree, they say, I go to college. So when they go to, you know, when they I get in the graduate program, master's or PhD, and then they say, I'm getting a master's or a PhD program at the university. But when they are in these initial four years or whatever years it takes them, it can be more or less. But uh, when they get in the, the um, bachelor's degree, they say, I'm getting a college degree and I'm, I'm, I'm going to college. There is also sometimes confusion that some universities do not have the word uh, college in the name. I mean, sorry, have the word college in the name. Like, for example, Boston College is actually a university. And sometimes the same issue comes up when you have like, for example, Institute. So for example, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So it is called a, an institute in the name, but it is a university. And so sometimes you would also use uh, or uh, hear the word uh, school applied to university. Again, extremely common in the United States. Uh, like when, when they wanna ask what university you go to. Most of the time, Americans will not say, what university do you go to? They would say, what school do you go to? Or which school is better? So when they talk about sort of, you know, universities and comparing them in some way, usually they use the word school. So they wouldn't say, I go to school. They would say, I go to college. But uh, is my school better than your school? Or what school did you graduate from? They would usually use the word school. And so school is very, very commonly used uh, to denote university in that context and so sometimes that may create some confusion and you're not sure so like if i go to boston college is it a real university or is it just some sort of a college because in some countries the word college may mean like for example high school sometimes called a college and in the united states by the way sometimes they do too so for example my children go to one goes to an early college and the other one goes to the middle college and so so sometimes that creates confusion and then also um, there is something that is called community college. And so that is not, now that is not a university. So a community college, that's usually a um, uh, sort of a, an institution that grants only associate degrees. Usually it takes like two years, maybe three years to get it. So it's not a bachelor's degree, it's an associate degree. And it used to be primarily for sort of trade schools, you know, like more like manual type of kind of jobs. But now they offer all kinds of degrees. It could be in programming, it could be in health care related, it could be just about any discipline, but they do not offer a full bachelor's degree. They offer associate degrees. And so a community college, that's not what most of the people who talk to me want, because that's usually 
it's not only sort of um, lower class, lower prestige. The point is that they do not grant the degrees. And so for immigration purposes, usually I suspect there may be a way to get a student visa to, to study at the community college, but usually it's not. So the student visas are designed for students who are getting a college degree or a master's degree or a PhD degree, but not an associate's degree. So I don't think it would be even possible to go to one of these let alone that you probably want to go to like a real university, not a community college. Uh, a community college is also very good for the local students. So community colleges tend to be very or much cheaper, much more affordable and often even free. And so what many local students do to save money because education in the US is extremely expensive, they would take uh, some courses at a community college for a year or two. And then they transfer to a real university to take the remaining courses and get the bachelor's degree, get the diploma. So community college, you don't want. Uh, college, university, all of those are good for you. Institute, school, academy, you need to look at what exactly that is because in most of the cases that would be just a university, but not always. It could be just a school, like a high school, or it could be just some bogus uh, you know, online institution that has bogus, meaning it doesn't grant degrees, but they may call themselves institute or academy. And finally, public versus private. Uh, again, many people don't quite um, understand how it works in the United States. So in some countries, <clears throat> private is always better. So uh, public institutions do not have much prestige, but private do. In many other countries, it's the opposite. Like in most of the European countries, the public institutions, you know, the government run. So those are real accredited universities uh, that are more prestigious and they appear in the top rankings. And then the public universe, I mean, the private university just appeared to basically just get some money from the students, but they are not carrying that same level of prestige and sort of credibility. In the United States, it doesn't really matter, meaning that, uh, Probably, um, I didn't look this, uh, at the statistics, but probably there are as many public universities as there are private. I'm guessing it's about half and half. And it really depends on the specific university. So you cannot say that one is better than the other. So among the top, top universities, yeah, like in top 10, many or most will be private, like Harvard, Stanford. But then there will be some public, like, for example, uh, Berkeley University. So Berkeley is a public university in California. Or some, uh, some um, uh, like, for example, the University of Texas at Austin, University of North Carolina, University of Wisconsin, uh, University of Michigan. Uh, so those are uh, very, very prestigious uh, public universities. Rivals, depending on the program, can be ranked even higher than some of these uh, top Ivy League schools. And vice versa, if you go down to the bottom of the list, you will see a lot of sort of good and bad, both private and public. So there will be some public universities that are, you know, just something not, not particularly prestigious. And there are many pub, uh, private universities that are not particularly prestigious. So you really need to look at the specific university to know the difference. So usually in terms of quality, in terms of how they teach, usually there will be not much, you know, like basically knowing if it's private or public doesn't tell you at all if it's good or bad. You need to look at a specific school. So private universities tend to be a little bit more sort of profit oriented. And as a result, they may be more sort of student experience oriented. So they may have smaller classes. They would have probably more support uh, for students to feel sort of good on campus. Whereas public universities often try to save money and then focus more on academics and less on pampering their students. But all in all, when it comes to quality of education, the prestige of the diploma, you really need to look at the specific university rankings. So don't really worry if it's public or private, especially if you are from um, a foreign country. So to you, as far as the cost goes, it doesn't really matter that much which one you go. To the local American uh, citizens or residents, it may be a huge difference depending on which state they go to. So one big difference between public and private for the locals is that when you go to a public university, like University of North Carolina, for example, usually the government of the state will pay a substantial portion of education. Depending on the state uh, and depending on your classification, the government may pay like 70% of the, of the cost. And usually it's like three to one. So basically foreign students have to pay a full fee 
and most of the time it's like twice or even three times as much as the locals. But you must be going to a university in your own state. So it must be in the state where you reside, where you pay taxes. In that case, you would qualify for uh, the, what they call in-state tuition. So meaning that a substantial portion of your fee will be covered by the uh, state in which you reside. But then if you go to a different state, like for example, my son applied to some universities in North Carolina and some in Virginia, and we are residents of North Carolina. And so a comparable university, so for example, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Virginia Tech University. So about the same in terms of you know ranking prestige, but uh, it would have been several times more expensive for him to go to the school in uh, Virginia because he's not a state resident. So he would be treated essentially as a foreigner and he would need to pay the full fee. Whereas if he goes to one here in North Carolina, then uh, it will cost him about a third of, of the actual price. The state will cover the rest. Internationals always pay full fee, uh, at least until they establish residence, and that usually takes a long time. And if you're a foreign student, it may be not until you become a green card resident. Um, so there, therefore, you would be paying full fee, so to speak, at both, and it doesn't really matter if it's private or, or, or public. So a long explanation just to begin with, because it you know sometimes confuses foreigners. All clear on this front? Um, yeah, but there's just one uh, term I read a lot, and that's post-secondary post -secondary degree. And I was wondering, uh, what is that referred to? Yeah, that's basically college and out. So, um, so your secondary education is considered your basically school, high school, and then post-secondary, that's all those other degrees that start basically at the university level. So it would be community college, it would be also post-secondary, I guess. And then, you know, bachelors. So, yeah, that's a good question. But yeah, in your case, uh, so you are a young man who will be getting a college or a bachelor's degree. So you're looking for universities, no matter what they're called. You're looking for uh, a bachelor's degree. Sometimes it would be BA, bachelor's of arts or BS, bachelor's of science. And sometimes there are all kinds of other, but um, it doesn't really matter. Like in most of the cases, bachelor's of science that would be more like STEM disciplines, maybe some number heavy uh, business disciplines, things like that. Maybe even some psychology, sociology degrees if they're sort of more research oriented. And BA would be more of the sort of like humanitarian, like history or uh, uh, maybe literature or, or maybe some business degrees. So those would be more BA, bachelor's of arts degree. So, but that's what you need. And then some people may already have a higher education as they call. So they would be then looking for a master's degree or a PhD degree. So now in terms of the degrees, levels of studies, as I said, you are looking for so-called undergraduate degree and that's the bachelor's degree. So undergraduate, that's bachelor's and graduate, that would be master's and PhD. And so undergraduate degree in the United States, so-called bachelor's, that's a full um, higher education sort of degree. So that's the kind of degree that most teachers have, engineers, architects, accountants, you know, basically, usually it takes, uh, in the United States, it's 13 years of school, so K to 12, 12 plus K, so 13 years in school, plus usually it takes four years of college, so-called college as a, as a, you know, level of studies. And so you get about 17 years of education, most of the Americans go to a college or bachelor's degree. Uh, they start at 17 or 18 when they graduate from school. Uh, some will obviously work for a while, but it would be usually like right around the, the time people turn 18 and then they stay for four years. So they would graduate around like 21, 22 with that degree. In some countries, uh, like for example, my native Ukraine, um, they kind of messed up a little bit the system. So they used to have what they called a specialist degree which was a five year degree after 10 years in school. But then they started sort of, uh, they call it Bolognian system or something, but basically they started reforming the education system. And so for the first few years, they split that specialist into four years of bachelor's plus one year of master's and everybody automatically used to do master's. You could probably drop out at the time when you get the bachelor's and then not get master's, but everyone was sort of automatically transferred. And so later they kind of separated them more. Now you have to reapply to get your master's. And uh, sometimes people even apply to a different university. 
Uh, but there is still this perception that uh, if you just get the bachelor's, it's not like a real degree. You get you have to get master's. In the United States, no bachelor's. That's the full completed education. If you go for a master's, almost not almost always. It's it's almost you know encouraged and almost always you go to a different school. And the master's degree used to be two years. Now you can find some typically you know maybe maybe for one year. But typically, it's two years. It's a whole different animal. It's much more sort of research-oriented, professional-oriented. Only a small portion of people do masters, like maybe 10% or so, maybe not even that, of those who did the bachelor's. So these are very different things. So you need the bachelor's for you. That's what you need to get. That's the degree that you would need to get next. And to apply to a master's degree or a PhD degree, you always have to have an undergraduate. And then for PhD, almost always, you have to have a master's first. So, and then you have the master's, uh, depending on discipline, it can be called whatever, you know, MA, master's of arts. Again, if it's more like humanitarian, you know, humanities or, or you know, uh, social sciences, uh, it's often called master's of science. If it's more like STEM, you know, math, science, engineering, but also some business degrees may be called MS. Like, for example, at my department, we have a, a master's of science in international business. I was a director of that program for a while. So it's called the Master's of Science. We have a lot of research related um, uh, subjects there. Same thing, MBA. We do offer several different MBA, Master's of Business Administration, uh, or there is MPA. Like for example, I have an MPA, Master's of Public Administration or Public Affairs, depending on which school you go. But um, in, in a way it's, you know, just basically signals which area you are in. So that's the name. But master's, that's usually, as I said, two years after uh, undergraduate, like mine was two years. And often you need to write a thesis, which is like your research sort of paper. Not all of them require that master's of science often require master's of arts, depending. But it could be like a thesis project or thesis research. And then when you go to a law school, uh, often they just call it a law degree, but technically it's it's a master's degree. So you have to have a bachelor's first. And so they um, can name it, diff or there are other uh, sort of like uh, so, uh, other degrees that have do not have the word master's in them, but actually are a master's degree, like like law, for example. But um, uh, I'm not sure there may be some other, like maybe an architecture somewhere or something like that. And then you have a PhD degree. Again, for you, it's too early to, to think about, but if anyone wants to get a doctorate degree, then PhD is so-called a terminal degree, meaning that it's the highest degree you can get in your field. Again, sometimes there is confusion because going back to my native Ukraine, they used to have um, two distinct degrees that they called a candidate of science and then a science doctor. And so they were separated very much. And so most people who get the candidate degree never would get the doctorate degree. And the process was very convoluted. And so they sort of looked at candidate as a full degree, so to speak. And so in the United States, there is nothing, well, when you're getting your PhD, there is a stage in the middle of the program where you become PhD candidate. So after you're done with your coursework and after you defend it, you are comprehensive exams and dissertation proposal, they call you a PhD candidate. So it's not a degree, it's more the stage at which you are in the program. So you could be called at that time a PhD candidate and sometimes they call, uh, say PhD, ABD, all but dissertation, so you kind of, but um, PhD, that's the, the actual final degree and that's what all those Nobel Prize winners have. So when you see how they give, you know, like in physics, the Nobel Prize goes to and in chemistry it goes to, those people have PhD degrees. So that's the highest you can get. And so it's kind of funny sometimes because uh, as I said, in some countries, they, especially the former Soviet Union countries, so they think that PhD, that's the candidate. And then the doctorate, doctors or science, doctor of science, that's such a degree that doesn't even exist in the United States, it's like it's even higher. And so American PhDs, all those Nobel Prize winners, all those professors, so they're not real doctors because they only have a PhD. And so, but anyway, in the United States, that's the terminal degree. That's the highest one you can get. So there is no uh, like an additional doctor of science or something. So it's PhD is basically doctor of science or the confusion here arises from the word philosophy. So it's technically stands for uh, philosophy, a doctor of philosophy, 
or philosophy doctor, but uh, that's from the Greek word philosophy, which basically means science. And so it is doctor of philosophy, not as a branch of, of science or discipline, it's philosophy as science in Greek. <clears throat> and then you would have like PhD in, like for example, PhD in management, PhD in international business, PhD in physics, PhD in chemistry and whatever your discipline is. And then there are some other specialized doctorate degrees such as MD, medical doctors. So that's a not a PhD, it's not in science. So there is no the word philosophy, uh, you know, Greek science, but it's a doctorate in medicine or JD, uh, a judicial doctor, so uh, doctor of uh, jurisprudence, so basically in, in law. Or there is a DBA, doctor of business administration. So it's in business, but it's not PhD in management or PhD in business, but it's a doctorate in business administration. So it's more like practice oriented. Again, one day, hopefully, we will be talking with you, Baktash, about how to get a master's and a PhD, but for now, you're focusing on undergraduate. All clear here? So, yeah. Okay, so now let's look at a little bit of, at, at the acceptance rates, just to give you a perspective of what your chances are. And so your chances probably are higher. So I know your record, um, you participated in Exculture many times. Uh, I've seen your resume. I know your sort of history and your life story. I think you will have a very high chance of being accepted uh, with a full stipend. Uh, but just to give you a perspective of what it looks like. So if you look at top, top, top universities like Harvard, Stanford, so they accept, depending on the school, but they ex accept like four to maybe 15%, some of them. So uh, they would probably get like 20 applications, maybe even 25, 30 per opening. And so that's from the number of people they uh, who apply. So you should understand also that people who apply usually think that they are worthy and can be accepted. It does cost a lot of, not a lot of money, but it does cost some time and effort. Uh, so, you know, hundred plus dollars often to apply and then you have to write essays. So you wouldn't apply just to see what happens. So you apply only if you think you have a reasonable chance. And so, uh, and most people would talk to friends and to counselors at school, to parents before they apply. And so if they're not even close, everybody will tell them, no, 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 Harvard, Stanford, Yale, I don't know, or Wisconsin, Michigan, Texas, North Carolina. So those are schools, you know, like too high for you. And so here they accept four to 15%, depending on the school from those who thought that they're worthy. And so to get into those schools, you have to be extremely interesting. And I'll talk about that um, soon, but we'll, you know, interest in that subjective. So we'll talk about that in, in a minute, but you definitely want to have excellent numbers, meaning that you want to have excellent test scores. Some of them don't require tests anymore, like they don't require any more SAT or um, ACT, but they still will have your GPA. They will still have your maybe TOEFL if you're a foreign student. Uh, whatever numbers they look at, they must be very, very high. So they must be at least top 10% and preferably even higher. I guess if you have something extremely interesting in your record, like maybe uh, you started a company that became successful, or maybe you have some, uh, you know, interest in political achievements. Maybe you led some sort of protest, or maybe you were elected to a parliament of, in your country, or you know, something like really, really remarkable. And uh, you may not be super strong academically, but you have something remarkable in your um, uh, record. Maybe in that case, you would have a chance. But otherwise, it's usually a prerequisite that you have something very, you know, uh, uh, very strong numbers. And then I call it here a major stunt. Like, as I said, it doesn't really have to be, but usually they're looking for people with something interesting, something that you've done that nobody else did, either in politics or maybe in business or maybe in social life or maybe in arts or sports, but they're looking for something, you know, like very interesting stuff in, in your record. Or you can be super rich. These are, many of these are sort of private schools or schools that rely heavily on um, uh, donations and money. And so I've heard many stories, and in fact, it's been a lot on the news that uh, super rich parents, you know, like very rich people, celebrities, politicians, in many cases make a sizable donation beyond the outrageously high amount that they have to pay for education, but they would like donate maybe a couple million dollars towards some sort of a building or project or stipend. 
And so, and then obviously their kids have an easier time being accepted, you know, things like that. And sometimes it could be also luck. Like, you know, you can have excellent numbers, everything is fine and not, you know, be accepted. And sometimes there is something in that, you know, essay or your record or resume that uh, they thought would be interesting. And so you kind of get lucky and you get accepted. And so when you apply to, for example, top 10 universities, and I've seen many, many people who did so, I've seen people, you know, being accepted to one and rejected from others. And so why would be the reason? I mean, you are, you are still the same student. They're still about the same rank. So, uh, but, you know, sometimes it's a matter of fit, as they call it, and it could be literally luck. Um, now, getting into these top, top schools, again, if you're super rich or you have something super, super interesting, yeah, you have a chance. But at the same time, if you go down the sort of scale and you skip the, you know, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, you know, and maybe some of these public schools, uh, if you go to top 100 in the world, these are still excellent schools, like very, very high school, schools who have uh, among their graduates, Nobel laureates, presidents of the countries. So like it's a very, very solid, you know, like, it's like, you know, it's it's very, very good. And so again, they still look and so they would accept maybe a little bit more like 10 to 25 uh, percent. But, you know, they still need excellent numbers. They still want to see a major stunt. They still would be more favorable, favorable towards super rich or influential affluent people. And luck still plays a role. Then you go to like top one in the world. So here we are talking about, depending on which ranking you look at, but there are about 20,000 uh, schools uh, in the world, uh, universities in the world total. And so top 1%, that's, uh, you know, that's like, you know, if you're in top few hundred, you usually are top one in the world. Like my university, University of North Carolina, Greensboro. So we proudly uh, put everywhere that we're top one in the world business school, to, top 1%, sorry, top 1%. So we are like the best in the region. We are among the best in the country in some degrees, but in the worldwide rankings, we're usually top one in the world. If you look at all, 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 you know, like uh, from, from the United States to, for example, Afghanistan and Ukraine, here we have countries. And so these are, again, solid schools. You still have some Nobel Prize laureates from these schools. You still have some influential politicians. You still have people graduating and going to very so solid careers. They may not carry that same level of sort of prestige and recognition. So even though the quality of education may be, you know, they teach the same courses using the same textbooks. Um, I wouldn't say that our professors are necessarily much less, you know, uh, different. They perhaps, again, may not have that same aura of prestige, but, you know, as, as far as the quality of education, I would say that as long as you are within, like, top 1%, if you go to, like, respected private and public universities in the state, you will still get very good education. So, uh, but they're a little bit more accepting. So, usually, depending on the school, like 25, 30, 40, maybe 50, 70, maybe even percent at some schools. And so, they still want to see good numbers. You still have to show solid GPA, solid um, um, uh standardized test scores, strong record, but they perhaps would accept people even if you did not become like a, you know, a parliament member at the age of 21 or did not win the Olympics or did not start a successful company or did not, you know, lead a, a you know, uh, a, a huge rebellion against some corrupt government. So as long as you show good numbers and strong record, you probably will be accepted, uh, you know, with a reasonable chance. And then you have sort of solid schools and others. So solid, yeah, not quite the same prestigious, like not the best school in the region, so to speak, just, you know, a university, you know, one of many. So those are much more accepting. So as long as you apply to a couple, you probably will be accepted to some of them. So again, we're talking about very good schools. I mean, they'll still give you good education. They'll still give you a uh, great experience, but perhaps, you know, among your teachers, there will be no like world-class, like at top one, you would have some professors who are literally top of their field. You know, they would be editors of most prestigious journals. They will be publishing in most prestigious journals. They will be going to the most prestigious conferences and getting best paper awards. So maybe not quite the Nobel Prize uh, as at the top 10 in the world, but you will still have very, very known, you know, world-class researchers and educators. At solid schools, you'll just have simply good professors. You know, again, they will not be necessarily the most published, uh, maybe not the authors of the most, you know, bestseller books, but they will be solid, good, you know, teachers. And so that's what it takes, you know, as long as everything's okay, you probably will get into that school. And then you have other, you know, that accept just about everyone, as long as you can apply, then, you know, uh, they'll probably take you. Uh, I will not name some of the schools, but I've heard some expressions like, if you can walk and talk, you can go to, and the name of the school, I don't wanna, it's, by the way, that, that school is really good, but, you know, it happened to be, 
in Canada in a province where you have some of the best universities in the world, like University of Toronto, York, uh, McMaster, uh, Queens, uh, Western Ontario. And so this one becomes sort of like a small fish in a big pond. And so they sort of make fun of that school, even though it's, it's, it's a very respectable school. So, uh, but then just getting accepted, so getting a stipend, it's a whole different story. So let me talk a little bit about the cost of education first, but then I have good news for you. So this is how much they typically cost. And um, so if you go to like the most prestigious universities like Ivy League, um, depending on the school, you would be looking at a tuition somewhere between forty to $80,000 a year. I think the last ones I checked, so some of them go as high as like 87 now, up to 90,000 a year. And um, it was almost unfortunate. So one of my um, uh, also ex culture students and uh, good friends now, and an extremely talented guy. I mean, he won every spelling bee, every science competition. He had like summer camps at most prestigious, like at Harvard, at Duke, uh, you know, like very, very strong guy. I mean, I cannot imagine anyone having a stronger academic record. And so uh, again, interesting about getting into, so he applied to all these leading schools like Harvard, like MIT, Stanford. Uh, he did get into an Ivy League top school. And so one of these most expensive schools, uh, Georgetown, so uh, uh, where he, you know, like the base fee is something like 80 something thousand dollars. But now in most of the cases, what the schools do, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes, but usually if you're an American applying in, in America, in the United States, um, your application process asks as many, if not more questions about your family income as they do about your academics. In fact, I'm, I was under the impression with my son who was applying last year that they asked more about my family financial status than about his achievements. Like, yeah, we did submit some, some you know, he submitted some transcripts and uh, in a few cases he, he was able to say something about his academics, but there were literally a lot of stuff related to financial situation. I had to include the tax returns, you know, basically my, my tax documents to show my real income and my real financial standing. There were a lot of questions about that stuff. And so it seems like the, the cost depends on how much you can pay. So in these top, top, top schools, they basically put an outrageously high price. But most people like that kid I mentioned, so both of his parents are professors and they make a pretty good salary. I mean, it's, it's yes, it's upper middle class. So they're not sort of rich, rich as some business owners are, but it's a, it's a family that is, relatively well off financially. So it's two parents working with very good, uh, you know, like solid salaries. And so even in his case, there was some uh, sort of uh, discount, let's call it this way. So they sometimes call it a stipend, they call it, but so even then, well, he's extremely talented too. So I suspect some of the discount was due to his academics. But um, so most of these schools will come and look at your income and they would give you some discount to make sure that you're total cost of education does not exceed certain per percentage of family income. And as you can imagine, like at $80,000 a year, so many people, like the whole salary is much less than that. The whole family income is much less than that. And so they understand that, you know, if we accept the student, there is no way the family will be able to pay it for four years, even if they stop eating, even if they live in a, you know, cardboard on, on the street, it's still not enough. And so in almost all of the cases, they will adjust your tuition depending on your income. And so uh, it will, it might be much less than, than you know, than, than the advertised total price. And so here there is sort of bad news and get bad uh, and good news. The bad news is that it's very, very expensive in the United States. And so uh, education is extremely costly. But the good news is that they look at your income and they almost always give you a discount so that your total cost does not exceed certain, certain family sort of, you know, threshold. And so if you come from, uh, let, let's not be politically correct here. So if you come from a kind of poor country or poor family, then uh, it's pretty much guaranteed as long as you are accepted that they will give you a substantial stipend. And again, if you're academically strong, if they're really interested in you, almost guaranteed they will give you full stipend. So in a way, applying to these top super expensive schools, in a way it's better to be poor or better to be from a developing country. Because in that case, as long as you convince them that you're a good enough candidate, and, and again, like I know your record, Baktash, I know you would be an attractive candidate to many schools. You have a lot of academic success. You have an interesting you know, life story. 
So I know you would be interesting. And so as long as they find you interesting enough, it's almost, well, nothing's guaranteed, obviously. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say almost guaranteed, but there is a very good chance they will give you a full stipend. And we'll talk about the sources of those stipends. It may not be from the university itself. It may be from some foundation. So there are ways to do it. But in a way, the good news here is that as long as you impress them enough, which again, you or many other young people I've seen can impress. Uh, so you probably will get a full stipend. And so you will basically get that education for free. So it's almost bad news for sort of middle-class families in the United States, because if it's a super rich family, like an affluent family, they don't care if it's $80,000 a year, they can totally afford it. In fact, they're, they're willing often to give a bribe to get in to pay that money. And again, we had some people who went to prison within the last couple of years for bribing uh, people at top universities uh, to get their kids in. So they don't care how much it costs for them. It's, it's nothing, you know, or it's affordable. Uh, and then if you're very poor, again, uh, sort of, you know, chances are you'll get a good stipend and you will be able to send your kid. It is the people in sort of the middle class that are, you know, in the worst situation because most of the time they do not get a stipend. So uh, their kids can be as talented, but, you know, the school, you know, as long as they don't have something you know, like, as I said, world-class achievements, as long as they're just a solid student, went to school, got good grades, maybe did some, you know, work on the side, maybe was, a, you know, school speaker or something like that, but nothing world-class level achievements, then yes, they can still get accepted. So as long as the numbers are great, they can still get accepted, but usually they would be paying, if not the full fee, then, you know, whatever the percentage they calculate that your family can afford. And that's where it becomes like, whoa, you know, that's a lot of money. Like talking about that Virginia Tech. So it's it's a very good school. It's one of the best technical schools. My son was accepted, but without a stipend. And so I think it was something like $54,000 a year. So uh, $54,000, you know, for, for the full, uh, you know, education. For me, that's a lot of money. So, and uh, I, I don't know how they did the math, but they probably decided that I can afford it. And yeah, I guess we will not go hungry if that's, you know, what I need to pay for him. But uh, in a way that sort of the middle class gets the worst deal at those schools. And then again, they look at um, sort of not only your income in the family, but also, you know, do you have siblings? There were questions if you have anyone that you sort of, you know, like maybe people with disabilities or some special medical needs. Is your family sort of, you know, how many kids, how many people, you know, dependents. So all of that is taken into the calculation. So the bad news, very expensive. The good news, as long as you impress them, they'll find a way to get you in. As long as, you know, like if you, so that's, that's not bad. So therefore, I encourage you to apply here because... To many people, it may be literally like in Europe, for example, some of the best European universities are free, like in Germany, universities are free, in most Scandinavian countries, they are free, but you still have to pay for your uh, food and uh, room and board. And if it happens to be not in the city where your parents live, and you have to get, you know, some, some housing, some food, you still have to get that money somewhere, and it would be probably at least like a thousand euros a month, which is, you know, if, if you have to study full time, can't work. It still be, can be prohib prohibitively expensive for uh, you know a kid from uh, you know like from a developed like for example for a kid in, from Ukraine or from Afghanistan for that matter, right? Because you know it still adds up to like fourteen fifteen thousand euros a a year, and so ironically in the United States it would be like ten times as expensive, but in many cases you would get the stipend, so uh, you would get the discount. So it's kind of sometimes it's strange, but for the most talented kids. It may be literally cheaper to go to the US or Canada than to go to some of these countries where education is sort of free. And here I have a breakdown of uh, tuition, you know, per year, like 20 to $60,000 in top 100 schools, 20 to 50 and so on and so on. So at my university, I think out of state is something like 25 or 30 per year. And it's much less if you're in state, it's like one third of that. So my wife is a student now, and I think it's something like seven or $8,000 a year. So it would have been, you know, like three, four times that much. Um, and then more if she takes summer classes. <clears throat> so it's it's still a lot of money for a foreigner, but it's much more affordable for, for a local. And um, again, stipends often are available, although perhaps not as many as at these top, top schools. So again, ironically, it may be easier for you to get a degree at, at the most prestigious university and get a stipend there than to go to like these solid schools that usually are much cheaper but also offer many fewer stipends. And so you have to pay on your own. So it may, it may be quite expensive. 
And then again, uh, often you would get accepted into a top school, but you still have to pay for your housing. Like for example, um, my son's friend um, was accepted. So he wanted to go to and wanted to, so he wanted um, a degree in engineering something. And so he wanted to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So it's uh, the main campus of our university system. He was accepted, but he didn't get a stipend. And so uh, I think they gave him the stipend for the education, but not for housing or something like that. And so the living expenses still will add up to like twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year. And so for him, that was too much. So even though I think he didn't have to pay the actual tuition, but his family cannot afford to pay for his, you know, housing and food and whatever else goes into it. And it still adds up to like 20, up to $30,000, depending on, you know, where you live, if you share a room, if you have a separate room and things like that. And so that was still too expensive. Same thing with my son. So um, he got into a few schools and so some of them in our city. And ironically, those are the schools that gave him a full stipend. And, but we don't really need it because, you know, he can live at home. He can, you know, just drive to school. It's like 10 minutes away. So both my university and his university. Uh, and then he eventually was accepted, you know, and, and accepted and went to uh, University of Toronto, which is a very, very good public school. One of the best, depending on which rankings you look at, you know, uh, and depending on which discipline, but it's a very good school. And so uh, he qualified for some major discounts. And so the education is something like $5,000 a year you know, that's, you know, nothing by North American standards. I totally can afford it. The problem is that we have to pay separately now for his living expenses. And so it looks like it will add up to about $25,000 a year, everything, you know, with, with housing, food, transportation, which again, you know, we can afford it. But I mean, it will be by the time he's done, it will be like $100,000, you know, for years. So that's, that's, you know, that's a substantial amount of money. That's like several cars or, you know, um, a good home, independent on which area you, you live. So it, it still can add up. So again, in a way, international students here may be in a somewhat better situation because as long as you get in and as long as they really want you and as long as it's a solid school, you probably will get a good stipend and probably that will cover everything. So I've seen quite a few kids from Ukraine, for example, who got into Ivy League, uh, very, very solid university and with a full stipend. And so uh, obviously if the kid was, again, I don't know, maybe this kid was so smart that they just wanted her so much that they would have given full stipend no matter what, even if you come from a millionaire family, but most likely they just kind of looked at the income and they said, yes, so she cannot afford it. So let's give her a full stipend, we want her. And then uh, if it was someone equally good, but the family has some money, they would say, well, but you can pay. So you would be paying. So, but anyway, if you go to an elite university, you really need to, you know, like, we'll, we'll see on the package that they will offer you. Will there be a stipend or not? So we'll have to see. But if there is no stipend and you don't go to like super elite, you just go to a solid school, you would be probably looking at about twenty, thirty-five thousand dollars a year, depending on the city, depending on the school. So that would be, you know, the bulk price. But again, in your case, Baktash, I, I'm pretty confident if you apply to 10, 15, some of the best schools, uh, they will probably offer you um, a, a, you know, a good stipend and you probably will not have to pay anything or maybe something very little. Um, now, one quick note on other schools, just so we know where we stand here. So um, you can also, you don't have to go to an American university. So there are other countries that are um, sort of, you know, have good education system and um, they're very much comparable in terms of quality and prestige of the universities. And so first and foremost, I would be looking at the, the United Kingdom. So you have some of the most prestigious universities there like Cambridge, uh, Oxford. I mean, obviously those are basically, you know, Harvard and Stanford level schools. In fact, maybe even more prestigious uh, if you ask, you know, uh, but, but then you also have, you know, like lesser known, but still extremely, you know, like um, um, all those, you know, uh, uh, London School of Economics or uh, the, what is it, the King's College, or, you know, there are a bunch of very, very good schools there. They tend to be also pr quite costly. So it's not free and the, the prices probably will be close to what you would be paying for comparable schools in the United States. Maybe a little bit cheaper, but generally it's very close and similar to the American sort of cost and prestige. Then you have the EU schools. Um, so depending on the country, you have, uh, you know, some of the very, very, you know, like in, in business, you would have uh, like some of the highest ranked schools like Rotterdam, 
uh, like uh, Copenhagen. Uh, so uh, you would have, I don't know, INSEAD. So there are a bunch of very, very prestigious schools in Europe, very good quality. And in many cases, they are free, like literally free. Like, you know, in Germany, all institutions are free. In Scandinavian countries, most are free. In uh, uh, the Netherlands, most are free. So the school itself will be free. But again, in most of the cases, you have to pay for your living expenses, which can add up. <clears throat> so the good news is that most European countries allow students to work. And so if you work for a while, uh, you should be making enough to cover your sort of room and board. The only caveat here is this. So for my son, we thought, well, I don't want to pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars in the United States. Let's send him to Europe to one of these you know, countries where education is free. And, uh, you know, yeah, we'll pay whatever it takes for housing and food so we can afford it. That's fine. But, you know, he'll be exposed to new culture. He will be in a safe, you know, environment and stuff. But it turns out that the free programs are usually the ones in the local language. Like usually if it's in Norway, it would be the Norwegian language programs. If it's, you know, Copenhagen, it would be in um, uh, Danish. Uh, so, or if you're in Germany, it would be like Technical University Munich. Munich. Uh, so we we're very interested in that. Usually you have to uh, speak German. And so they, they often do have programs in English, but those are not free. Again, they will not be as expensive as in the United States, but the choice of disciplines will be much, much fewer so uh, you may not have your, you know, like, for example, if you want to be an engineer, like business, yeah, probably they'll have something in English, maybe some other ones. But if it's, you know, like engineering or medicine, usually it would be in a local language. And uh, if they do have something in English, then it would cost, uh, again, not quite as much as in the United States, but there will be a substantial fee. And then it becomes sort of a problem. So if, yeah, if you speak German or if you speak Danish, uh, maybe it shouldn't be a problem and, you know, you just get in the local language program, get a great, you know, education nearly for free, uh, you know, whatever it costs you to live there. But if you only speak English or, you know, other languages, but not the local language, then, yeah, it, it actually becomes quite expensive. So the EU didn't quite work for us. And so uh, it wasn't, you know, that easy. Canada, very interesting. So um, Canada is, again, very similar to the United States. Um but again, as far as the cost goes, not much cheaper, somewhat cheaper, but not much cheaper for foreigners. So the full price, yeah, so there will be 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars, maybe even more depending on the university. Like if you go to some of the most prestigious schools, like as I said, like Toronto, University of British Columbia, McGill, they will still cost a lot for foreigners. Uh, Toronto is about like $50,000 Canadian, so it's a little bit cheaper if you look at the, at the exchange rate, but it's still quite expensive. But the good thing for Canada is that if you happen to be a Canadian permanent resident or citizen, so uh, they give you a very substantial discount. It looks like it's about like 80, 90 percent or 80 probably. Uh, so in the United States, it's like 60, 70. In Canada, it looks like it's 80, 90. So if you're a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, then it's much, much cheaper. And so um, uh, that makes it more interesting for people with Canadian passports, uh, obviously. But then for foreigners, I guess it doesn't really make much difference. And so you would still be required to pay the full tuition unless you get a stipend. So from this perspective, I guess, if it's a foreign passport, Canada and the US look about the same. So again, if you if you are aiming at paying yourself, Canada may be a little bit cheaper, so they still subsidize education a little bit more. But then if you need to get a stipend, not a fact that Canada is, e like in Canada, probably not even easier to get a stipend. Uh, so uh, it's probably going to be maybe even easier in the United States. So again, my kid applied to a few schools in Canada. He got accepted to several. He got rejected from quite a few too. And so um, I don't think he got a full stipend from any of them. So again, having a Canadian passport, uh, whatever they wanted him to pay, it's like very, very cheap. I mean, it almost doesn't matter in the full cost of education, you know, housing, food, flying back and forth for holidays. So the tuition was not really a factor that much in that amount. But again, if someone doesn't have a Canadian passport, so from this perspective, Canada is a beautiful country. I love it. Uh, I would highly recommend Canada. It's a safe country but it's not necessarily going to be cheaper or chances of getting a stipend not necessarily will be higher.
And then you have Australia and Canada, I mean, in New Zealand, they're kind of similar to Canada. They have a somewhat stranger process of applying. So we almost never could figure out, how, well, we did figure out how to apply. And my kid even submitted some applications to uh, New Zealand, uh, some universities he wanted to go there. But again, we messed some things up. So apparently he applied for a wrong term. Like it's a little bit, you know, it, it takes some time to figure out how, <clears throat> how it works. <clears throat> but they have, um, again, excellent universities in Australia and in New Zealand. Some of them are like virtually world-class. And so these are very interesting countries and there is a possibility to get a stipend. So I would definitely look at those countries if you don't mind going that far. Usually they are kind of far from everywhere. So. Uh, now paying for studies. <clears throat> so here, um, if you are local, so if you are an American citizen, Canadian citizen, usually you pay from your pocket. It seems to me that about 80% of the kids, maybe even more, they just, the family pays. So as I said, most of them don't get the stipends. Uh, the schools kind of figure that you can afford it. So you just go and you pay and uh, you pay out of pocket. Like my son, yes, you know, being a Canadian citizen, he got a substantial discount. Uh, but yeah, we pay, like I write a check or pay with a credit card or, you know, just whatever other method you want to pay. Uh, many get student loans. <clears throat> so a good number. I don't know what the percentage is of those who get student loans, but I would say when I said 80 pay out of their pocket, probably no, maybe like half pay, you know, have enough money to pay and another half usually get a student loan. And usually those are available to locals only. And so you get the loan and then depending on your sort of success career uh, in, in, you know, in whatever field you go, if you get a very good job, uh, like let's say you go to Georgetown and let's say you have to pay like $50,000 a year or $40,000 a year after discount. And so you get a student loan. And so you end up spending like, I don't know, <clears throat> $200,000 over the course of your studies. Uh, it seems like it's a lot of money, but then you get a good job as an engineer, as a whatever else, you know, architect, uh, a lawyer, whatever you do. And you, you make like $150,000 a year. So you still have to pay for your food and housing and mortgage and taxes and everything. But usually even that very large amount of money, you can pay it off like in five years, maybe in 10 years. So no big deal. But then some people go to some of these schools or not even necessarily expensive schools. They may go to something, you know, solid, but not elite. And so they would be like, you know, uh, they need, let's say, $30,000 a year. So 10 for education, 20 for living or something like that. And so they still leave the school with like $40,000 in loans or $50,000 in loans. And so, but then they get just a job, you know, like not a particularly, you know, well-paying job. And they can, can only pay, let's say, I don't know, maybe like a few hundred dollars per month towards that loan. So some of them can spend literally like their entire life trying to pay them off. And we have a lot of people who literally now are approaching retirement and still paying student loans. So it, it really depends on your uh, career success and how much you're making and how much is your loan. But again, you shouldn't really worry about that. that just to give you a perspective because you know most international students wouldn't even qualify for the government student loan unless you get it from like your local bank somewhere in your country. So, but usually that's not how people pay for it. Many get a job on campus again, but it's mostly for locals. Uh, you are as a foreign student, you would be allowed to work up to 20 hours a week on campus. And as a foreign student in uh, at the University of Texas in Dallas, I did work for 20 hours a week as a teaching assistant and then as an instructor. Uh, so, and they would pay me, but usually for the visa, you need to show that you can pay for your education without working. So either you need to show a certain amount of money in your account, sort of put aside for education. In most cases, it's like $20,000, $30,000 that you have the money to pay, or you get a stipend uh, and you show a letter that shows that yeah, you got a stipend from the university itself, maybe from some foundation, maybe from some government governmental stipend. You can still work and supplement that with your hours, but you wouldn't be able to get accepted with the you know where you have to pay and you say I'll be working and paying from that. So they will say, well, no, that doesn't work. We don't know if you're going to get a job. <clears throat> we don't know if you will have. Uh, enough sort of energy to do both job and studies. So usually you have to show that you already have the money to pay or a stipend in place, even if you're allowed to work on top of it. And so then after a year or two, you know, if, if, if everything goes fine academically, even if your family no longer can support you, but you still have a job at that stage, it's probably going to be enough. But initially, usually you cannot rely on, you know, you cannot plan that you will arrive 
you'll find a job on campus, like in a bookstore or as a teaching assistant or a lab assistant. And you'll pay, usually you need to show them that here is the money or here is a letter from a sponsor, a stipend, whatever that is, and you know, you'll pay for it. And so the stipends here, as I said, um, the university itself offers sort of discounts. Again, they can call it a stipend, <clears throat> but essentially a discount. Almost everybody gets something based on the income. And there may be an additional stipend depending on how badly they want you. And they would call it a merit-based stipend. Um, uh, my kid got a couple of those uh, partial stipends, you know, not like large amounts from some of the universities. And they would say, uh, here is your stipend that is as good as you are or something like that. Or you're a great student and here is a great stipend for you. And again, sometimes it could be as small as like a couple thousand dollars a year. Sometimes it can be more like $10,000 a year. And sometimes it could be full ride. As they say, you know, everything's uh, covered. Again, in your Bakhtash case, you're a good student. You have an interesting life story. You have some interest in achievements. I think you will get full stipends from at least some universities if you apply to several of them. Um, other students, well, depending on the record, but there is a good chance to get, you know, a substantial stipend, especially if your family cannot pay. And then in addition to university itself, <clears throat> in many cases, when you apply, you can put check marks, you know, I want to be considered for other stipends. And so the stipend itself can come from somewhere else. Like for example, that student uh, that I spoke to that got into an Ivy League school started this year. So she got a full stipend and it came from, I forgot what the name of that, you know, um, fund is, but it's a full stipend. And so some very rich person, uh, I don't know if he dead or, you know, he's dead or not, but he left a huge amount of money, specifically stipends for kids who go to Ivy League. So basically he said, as long as you get into an Ivy League university, I'll pay for your stipend, like everything. I'll cover everything. And I don't know how many of those they give out. I'm sure you have to be better than most to get that stipend, but it's not from the university itself. It's from an external private foundation, but you know, that's also a source. And in many cases, you don't even need to apply separately for that. You just, in your application, you say, I want to be considered for, for any stipends available. And then the university on your behalf sort of will look into those possibilities and find ways, you know, to, to get you the money so that they still will get the money in the end because it goes into tuition. So for them, it's sort of in, in their interest to find a stipend for you from external sources so that they can get you and that money with you going into their account. And then there are also governmental stipends, like for example, Fulbright's Muskies. Like when I did my uh, master's in Texas, I had a Edmund Muskie, whatever, full stipend. And so Fulbright and Muskie, they're very similar. And so... Um, I, I had two years fully covered. They paid for not only all my education, you know, stipend, you know, but they even paid more for my books, paid for my travel. So it covered everything, like every single penny related to education. You can get those as well. Usually those require a separate application and usually they have like a separate process, but there are some governmental sort of stipends like that. So the catch with Fulbright and Musk, in my case, at least it was that I did not choose the school. So I applied for the stipend and then they said okay well we sent we are sending you to dallas to texas so which was fine i was very happy there but also it comes with a j1 visa which has some restrictions and we'll talk about that some other time so uh and then sometimes there are local governments that offer stipends uh so like for example i've heard about like iranian government offers stipends to iranian students and then saudi arabian government often uh, offers you know stipends usually they come with some conditions like you have to spend some time in the country after your education you know working for the government and things like that so there are things like that all right so any questions so far all clear <clears throat> So let's talk about the process of applying to schools. And so first I'll give you like, you know, a dry list of what's needed. And then we will talk about the, uh, some, not really tricks and tips, but you know, some background information. So usually when you apply to a university in the United States, you would have to submit a bunch of documents. And again, we'll talk about something called common app in a few minutes, but usually there will be an application for you. In many cases, it can be waived. Like if you say, I cannot afford to pay it, in many cases, there is a way to waive the application fees. So it's possible 
And uh, yes, if you apply to like 10 universities or maybe more, I think we spend something like $2,000 on application fees with my kid or maybe 1500 because we applied to a bunch of schools in Canada, in the United States. And so each time it's like 75, 80, 100, $150. And so it quickly adds up to, to a substantial amount. Then obviously you have to attach or you know submit uh, copies of your transcripts uh, so basically all your prior diplomas and grades and stuff like that. And again, the process may require, sometimes it could be that you simply attach a photocopy, but in many cases it may have to be provided by your school. And again, if you're from the United States, it's easy. You just basically tell your school which university, school, like high school, you just tell them which universities you apply to. And then they simply um, uh, uh, send it on your behalf. But if you're from a foreign country, from a different country, in many cases, it could be somewhat problematic because some countries just do not send transcripts to universities. And so sometimes it may take a little bit, you know, creativity to, to you know, to figure out a way to submit them. So you may have to talk to some officials at your school. They may not know what you want from them. Uh, you will say, well, you know, they require you to send that transcript. So sometimes it literally goes as far as, um, people print their transcript, put it in an envelope, write the name of their school on the envelope here and send it by mail as if it was sent by your school. But again, usually now schools know how it works, so it shouldn't be a problem. It's submitted electronically, but just be prepared that it may be somewhat challenging. Um, <clears throat> then you have to write an essay and usually several of them. Again, I'll talk about the Common App in a few minutes, but um, there is something called Common App that you know you submit your documents once, and then you just specify which universities you want those documents to go to. And so this way you don't have to submit them separately each time you, you select a different school. And so usually there will be one essay that you write for all universities, Common App essay. So one where usually you talk about yourself, who you are, you know, why the school should be interested in you. And so that one would be your main big, uh, you know, like a three page essay. <clears throat> but in many cases, almost always universities want additional essays for them se separately. So there would be one general common app essay written for all the universities, but then, you know, the school that you're applying to, they also want you to answer a few more questions specifically. And so you, there may be several other, usually shorter essays, maybe two or even three or four. And so you will need to write those. And so those school specific essays, uh, they will be addressed, uh, addressed to a specific university. And then sometimes uh, it used to be always now, not always, but often uh, universities want you to take um, a so-called SAT or ACT test. So basically um, a general admission test or a general scholastic test as they call it. So it will test your math skills and reading skills and things like that. And so usually they don't care which one of these two you take, uh, but they want to see a certain level of performance, usually a certain percentile. Like if you're going to a top school, they probably will want to see like top five, maybe top 10% and preferably top 1%. Or let me put it this way, they will have a lot of applicants who will have top 1% scores. Like they're better than 99% of the people who took the test. Um, others may not even be interested in those tests or no longer require them. You can still attach them if you have good results. You might want to attach them to impress the school, but you don't have to. And so if you have excellent results, you probably want to attach them. <clears throat> but if your results are not impressive, maybe you don't even need to attach them. Then there will be recommendations. <clears throat> Usually they want two or three. And again, the process used to be <clears throat> that I would write a recommendation, put it in an envelope and mail it by mail, but now it's all electronic. And so usually the way it works is you will specify the names of the professors or maybe managers or other people who know you um, in the system, in the common app, and you would provide my name and my contacts and my credentials. And then the system will email me and say, Bakhtash, for example, applied uh, to our university and specified you as a referee, as a person who will be given a recommendation letter. Can you click on this link and write your recommendation letter? And so uh, it will take me quite some time, but I will do it. And so they get it. And then sometimes there will be uh, like additional statements or some other, you know, peculiar things that you might need to have that there. And again, so what helps <clears throat> with this sort of dry stuff Yes, it helps to have good test scores. 
it helps to have good GPA. So great point average, good grades from school, good marks from school. Uh, strong essay always helps a lot. And I'll talk about that separately. It always helps to have major achievements, like, you know, maybe a winner of competitions, prizes, you know, things like that, awards. Always, always they're looking for some extracurricular. So you want to be maybe a club leader, a club member, maybe sports, maybe summer school, summer camps, maybe some research that you did. So they are looking for, you know, like simply going to classes, getting good grades, not enough. You want to show other things. They call it a rounded personality, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, they want to see more things. Uh, so competitive athletes, maybe, maybe military service, maybe, as I said, some major stunts, like maybe some you know, social activist or or business uh, company founder or, you know, like world savior, as I say, you know, maybe something related to ecological, you know, movement and things like that. Now, <clears throat> extremely important. So this is probably the most important sort of message that I can give you. Um, any questions, Baktash, so far? All clear? Um, I have a couple of questions here. Go so... ahead, and, because we're moving to something serious. So go ahead with your questions now. Okay, so first first thing is about the diploma, the high school certificate. Or, um, so, uh, as you mentioned, most uh, schools require us to send it to them, mail it, or or like uh, get our schools to send it to them. But as you know, uh, high schools in Afghanistan they don't do that. They actually they don't even issue these. Uh, documents you you have to go to the Ministry of Education and get those documents, so they they won't send that, but but even I can send that through mail because this is like the the only document I have from from high school, and it's kind of not safe if I send it out if I mailed it and it, it kind of got lost in the way. So, yeah, and, and you definitely don't want to send an original. So that's, you know, you definitely don't send. But anyway, let me talk about this. You're asking a very, very good question. And over the years, like more than 20 years that I've been in the North American education system, I've seen, I've seen it all, so to speak. So, for example, the latest development that I had to struggle with was that um, I was helping several Ukrainian students to apply to universities in Canada and the United States this very year. And um, uh, now, by now, most Ukrainian schools know how it works and they can send it. But because of the war in the country, the schools were closed. So uh, some of them were offering classes online, but most of the school administrators were not in the school. Like you could not just walk into the school and say, hey, Mr. Counselor, Director, you know, Principal, Headmaster, whatever the name, can you please send uh, my transcript to this university? So that person would not even be in country often, you know, not even, you know, at, at the working desk. <clears throat> and so that was a big problem. And so we tried a few times with a few students to explain to the university why we cannot provide those documents because there is a war. And several universities said, okay, yeah, I believe you just submit a photocopy of the actual diploma if you have it. <clears throat> and so, uh, or, uh, you know, high school, um, uh, they, they may call it a, a start, a testament, or, you know, diploma, whatever you call it. But the problem was that I had a few students also who were uh, like first or second year students in a Ukrainian university. And so there was, for example, this one student who eventually did get with a full stipend to a university in Canada. But um, so she completed one year at a university in Ukraine, and they wanted to see the transcript from the university. <clears throat> and so she didn't have a copy of it. So she didn't graduate yet. So she was taking classes online. So she didn't even have a, you know, a photocopy that she could send. And so we had to explain, we had to say, there is no way we can send it. I mean, the school is, university is closed. Uh, all the officials are not at home. Uh, they are, who knows where they are. That kid herself was in Austria at that time. So she cannot even walk into the university. Maybe there was someone, you know, in the offices there, but, you know, she was away. And so eventually we, ha we had to explain that, you know, that that's what it is. And they said, okay, well, we believe you, that's fine. So go ahead. I think she needed to explain, you know, what grades she expects to get or something like that, but she couldn't even access that, you know, like there was no online system where she can log in and even see what grades she got <clears throat> because, you know, everything was messed up. So that that's a problem. And so sometimes you can just explain the situation, like honestly explain that it's, you know, what what's going on and they, most of the time they'll probably understand and you know will be fine with it 
On the other hand, I remember we had a problem with my wife. So like it's a long time ago. So it was at the time when we still had to mail documents. <clears throat> so it was before the electronic system. And so she goes to her own schools and says, can you please send my transcripts to the University of Texas at Dallas? And they're like, oh, what do you mean? I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm allowed. Uh, I need to maybe get a permission from the I don't even know whom, you know, the Ministry of Education, I don't know, you know, what do we do? And so, so people there just literally, you know, like, especially being, you know, like the, the Soviet Union had just collapsed, it's a command, you know, like a oppressive regime, everybody's afraid to do something that they're not allowed to do. And so that was so complicated. So eventually what she did, she literally just took a photocopy of her diploma, went to a lawyer to notarize it then put it in the envelope and re literally read the address of the school as if the school mailed it and put it in mail and send it. And the problem here is that if you send it any other way, there would be a clerk at the university who just, you know, put check marks, like sometimes maybe when I like a student or maybe some somebody, you know, like lower ranks person who, who doesn't make the decisions whether or not it's good or not. And so she has a checklist and she says, okay, did the, did the transcript arrive? Check. Does it have the signature across the seal? Check. Is it addressed from the school? Check. Okay, then it's good enough. Anything's missing? No check doesn't count. And with thousands of people applying, they may not even have the resources and time and, and the channel and the means for you to contact them and to explain the situation. So sometimes it could be tricky. With Ukraine also, another student, um, eventually we figured that you can contact the Ukrainian embassy and they had a way to sort of send the document on, on, on your behalf. So they somehow can connect to the Ministry of Education. I think somehow they can verify that you really graduated from that school. And then they sort of notarize and even send on your behalf. So there may be a way for you to contact the Afghani embassy and they may have a process. I assume you're not the only student from the country applying. And so they may have a process to do it. Uh, but yes, it will be... It will take some research. It's probably different for every different country. Whatever method we found for, for Ukrainian students may not apply to you. So the best way would be to contact the school, you know, the university that you're applying to. And there will be still a way to call the admissions office. And maybe I'll help you with that too. And so we'll write a nice letter or maybe even call them and say, I'm a student from Afghanistan. Uh, I did graduate from high school, but you know, here is the situation. So they cannot submit the usual electronic way. Uh, my, my transcript, can we think of something else? Can I maybe send you a notarized copy? Can I maybe send you some letter explaining the situation? And most likely they will say, yes, you're not the only one. We've seen it all from different countries. Here is you know, what we do in cases like this. And so it's, let me put it this way. It's guaranteed that we'll find a way to send the document to them but it may take a lot, a lot of sort of talking back and forth with the university, with the embassy, with the school, who knows else with whom, but eventually we'll probably find a way to make it work. But yes, it will take some time. Same thing, it may be a little bit more complicated like with uh, recommendation letters. Again, some, like for example, I write, I don't even know, like dozens and dozens every year of those recommendation letters, maybe even hundreds. Like it's it's so many, like so, so often students ask me that I'm, you know, almost annoyed. But again, some people wrote, you know, professors wrote many of those letters for me throughout my career. Now it's my time, my turn. So one day you will become maybe, you know, a prominent figure that people will be asking for recommendation letters you'll be writing those things. So I kind of have a process of doing it quickly. But again, I know every time I get that request, I click on the link, I have my process, I have my templates done. But sometimes you go to your teacher, professor, let's say in Afghanistan, who never did it, who maybe not, doesn't even speak English. And so all of a sudden it becomes a big problem. They're like, oh, how do I do it? What I do it? Am I allowed to do it? Maybe I should talk to my supervisor, you know, headmaster, principal, director of the school. Maybe I need to get a permission from the, ministry if i'm allowed to do it oh i cannot do it in english maybe you can write it and then i'll sign it and all of a sudden it becomes such a complicated story just to get that damn you know recommendation letter not to mention that sometimes people don't know what should go in the recommendation letter so you have a teacher who is you know knowledgeable can give you a strong letter but just doesn't know how to do it right and so all of a sudden that letter becomes not a positive thing even though he thinks you're a great student but if the letter is done wrong then it actually, you know, kind of hurts your chances rather than helps your chances. And so in many cases, that takes a lot of time. Not to mention that you may also have professors 
who say, sure, I'll give you a recommendation letter, but then never do. And so with my son, it was a problem. So we had a couple of teachers who just never, you know, they, they apparently like my kid. He got a good grade uh, in their courses. So they, you know, they, they were willing to write a strong letter, but just were busy, maybe irresponsible. And so uh, we keep getting letters from the university saying that your application is incomplete because we're still missing a couple of recommendations. And so he would go to those professors and say, hey, are you going to write the letter? And they, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. And then still don't do it. And so um, likewise, sometimes you just don't know what they're going to put in the recommendation letter. So you don't want to kind of risk it. So you almost want to maybe talk to them and ask, are you willing to give me a strong recommendation letter? Because you don't want to have a recommendation letter that just says, yeah, Baktash, I don't even remember him. Eh, yeah, he's probably okay. So that's not good enough. You want a strong letter. And so in many cases, you sort of want to make sure that they put all the right things in there. So recommendations, transcripts, if you're from a different country, and even if you're from the United States, but if you're from a different country, be prepared uh, that it will be somewhat a hassle. It will take as much time as everything else. But uh, yeah. Uh, anything else? You, you said you had several questions. Um, yes, uh, it actually was about the recommendation. Uh, I think you answered the question. Uh, well, this whole uh, applying thing is relatively new for Afghans. Yeah. Uh, and of course, after all this, uh, after what's going on right now, it's like something yeah. people don't think about it that much. But yeah. even for this, it was something new, uh, something actually alien. Teachers didn't know yeah. uh, what they were supposed to write, what the recommendation letter was, or of course they, they didn't speak English. And as you mentioned, they were kind of afraid of the authorities. They didn't know yeah. if it was, I don't know, legal or something. And uh, after I I would insist, they would say that like, okay, you, you write something yeah. in English, put down my name and send it on my behalf. But if something happens, uh, I'm not taking any responsibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it kind of makes so, me smile because uh, if you because you know I got what like uh, s several universities that I went through. Then my wife applied to several, and then countless dozens and dozens of you know kids that have been helping. Many of them from Ukraine, and yes, that's a very typical story. Very typical story. I'm afraid. I don't know. You do it on my behalf, but yes, if anything happens, <laughs> you know, I will say that I don't know you. So uh, very true. And uh, in your case, Baktash, again, so it's probably safer. So you know me, and I know you. You know Dr. Baumanis. Again, you've been an exculture, so we can get you enough American professors to write the letters who know how to do it, so you don't have to worry. Uh, likewise, if anyone who's watching, if they went through X culture again, you kind of said when it comes to recommendation letters, we know enough about you to get enough professors to write those letters for you. So you don't even have to mess with, you know, people from your country and go through these hassles. But if if you are just a student and, you know, you just happened to be watching this video and uh, you are from a country where this is not a standard procedure. Yes, allow several months, several months to take care of this. And, um, you know, plus again, Baktash, even when you deal with, you know, standard system, you still have to uh, approach recommendation letters in a very strategic way. So as they said, first you ask if the professor is comfortable giving a strong recommendation letter. And some professors may not be like, you know, in many cases, a student would approach me who was not a good student, you know, who was not a, you know, student that I would confidently recommend. And so in those cases, I honestly say, you know, look, you know, in my class, you didn't get a very good grade. Maybe you participated in ex-culture, ex but, you know, your, your team was not happy with you. So I, I, I cannot tell that you are the best student that I would recommend. So you better off go maybe to somebody else. Maybe you did something with another professor. So, um, but I try to be honest about that. So if, if like, I never write bad recommendation letters, like, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but if I cannot give a strong letter, I usually say, you know what, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm not gonna give you a strong one and I don't want you to write a, you know, don't want to write a bad one. Maybe you should find someone whom you impressed more and get the letters from them. But there may be professors who would say yes to everyone and then literally just write, you know, John was not a very good student. He missed a lot of classes. I cannot recommend him. I'm not sure if it's ethical or not, but that happens. So you wanna be sort of careful with this. Second, <clears throat> when it comes to recommendation letters, um, you, um, it takes a lot of time. 
And so, yes, every time I get, you know, somebody requests a recommendation letter, I'm like, oh, shit, you know, not again, because it takes a lot of time. It takes at least an hour of my time and maybe even longer because you have to write it. And even though I have templates, but I need to, like most of the time, I don't even remember the student I have, you know, like for example, this semester I have about 500 students in all of my classes. Plus I have, um, uh, what, like six, 7,000 uh, ex-culture students. So I literally have like 12,000 students that I deal with this semester alone. And so uh, obviously I don't remember most of them. I mean, I may remember some of the most sort of prominent students, but not most. And so I would need to go and check the performance records. I check what grade they got. I look at their work. I look at the, at the culture records. If it's, you know, it takes time and then you have to write it up. And so what you do to make it easier for the professor, you say, and here are some things that, you know, I'm providing for you to make it easier for you. When it was by mail, I would always include envelopes with post stamps and already addressed to the university. So professor doesn't need to look for the addresses, doesn't need to pay for the postage. They just put the letter in the envelope, seal and mail. Now that it's electronic, I still provide like, for example, I say, here is a copy of my CV, but that's not enough. CV still takes like half an hour to read and review. So I would always include, and here is a bullet list of my achievements. Like, you know, I won this competition. I went to this school. So basically things that professor can sort of mention in the letter. So you want to provide it as easy as, okay, here is the list. And as I write, I just type. Better yet, include things that are copy and paste ready. So you, you usually don't offer the professor to, you know, I'll write the letter, you just sign it. But you prepare as much text as possible that the professor can copy and paste. For example, you say like, you know, I had these jobs over the years and these are the functions I performed. And so I literally copy and paste, maybe slightly change it. So it, it saves me time. And it also ensures that all the right things will be mentioned in the letter. So you don't want to sort of um, uh, leave it up to the professor to know those things or to read your resume carefully because many of them don't have time to do it. So whatever you think needs to be mentioned you mentioned that in that cover letter that you sent to the professor saying, hey, and in case you would like to comment on my other achievements, here are some things. And so you kind of write it for the professor in a way that is almost like copy paste ready. And some professors may even say, hey, why don't you like, for example, again, I'll be honest. I ask the students that why don't you write sort of almost a template for me? I'll work with it. So I never, I never, ever copy, like just take what students wrote and sign it but I want to get something from them so I can review it. And if it's honest, if it's true, if it matches my record, it saves me a lot of time. It ensures that I don't miss anything. And so this way the student ensures that I say all the right things in the, or don't miss all the important things in the letter, but it also saves me time. And so some professors may say, yeah, send me that list so I can have a ready, you know, like template. I will still, you know, like maybe I'll drop some things if I don't think that it's fair or, or true. I will add a few comments of my own, but at least there is some information that I need to work with. Because otherwise, all I remember about you, well, you, Baktash, obviously, you know, we will work together enough, so I know enough things about you. But if it's just, you know, some name, I may remember that that student showed up for class, but I don't really know anything else other than maybe the grade. So you want to give those things to, to the professor so that it's easier for them and they don't miss anything. All right, so uh, let's talk about, you know, what universities want. So this is probably the most important thing that, um, uh, you know, if you understand this, you're golden. So um, how should I put it? Let's talk about the university interest. So you know, what does the university want? The university wants uh, people who will become successful in life. The university wants people who will make the university proud who will go on to have successful career, who will become, if not presidents and prime ministers and, you know, World Bank, you know, presidents and directors, then at least will have a solid professional career in, in, I don't know, business, politics, arts, whatever the discipline. So they want you, they want people who will be successful. And the reason for that is because one, if you are successful, it reflects good on their reputation. 
So more people will apply to them. They will say, oh, isn't that the university where Bakhtaj Ghani went, who became eventually the, I don't know, the president of, of Afghanistan, or maybe uh, a prominent businessman, or maybe a prominent, I don't know, movie maker, or whatever you will become. So I want to go to that school because I hear graduates from that school become Nobel Prize winners, you know, politicians, whatever, leaders. So they want you, they want people who will become so successful that they can tell the world, look, you know, our graduates go on to do those great things. And so uh, that's one thing, so that they can use your success to sell their product. Second, many of these universities, at least in North America, they depend on you for donations. So if you look at um, like Harvard, Stanford, but also, you know, lower class schools, much of their money comes from donations. So they want people who will be so successful that, you know, like 20 years later, when you become a billionaire, you say, okay, well, I really like this school. So here is a check for a million dollars or maybe a $10,000 or maybe $1,000 every year, whatever that is. But they want people who will become successful, not only that they can present your success as their achievement, but also you are so successful that you can share that success in the form of donations with them. And third, um, they can also, um, uh, you know, they're also interested in interesting people on campus because they recognize that education is not books. You know, if it all were about, you know, how to multiply and divide and, you know, and, and, and you know, I don't know, treat people, you know, medically, uh, then it would be easy. You would just get the books and you would read them and you would um, basically, uh, you know, get the knowledge. But the, the value of education is, is not in, in books, not in lectures. The biggest value of the university is that you are among very interesting, very successful, very, you know, sort of driven, success-oriented young people, people who are different from you, people whom you can learn from. So the real value of these, uh, you know, universities is that you will be in an environment for years among other interesting people, and you probably will learn even more from interacting with your peers than from the actual lectures by professors. And so universities know that. And so they want to populate their campus. They want, you know, interesting, interesting people, people from whom students can learn. And so you, Bakhtash, you make a very, very strong candidate. Again, as I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure you will get accepted into many American schools with full stipend because you are unique. You know, you are from Afghanistan. I mean, how many people from Afghanistan apply to a university? I mean, I don't think many. I mean, I, I don't even think there are many people from Afghanistan who are applying to any university, uh, you know, in the West, let alone to the specific one where you apply. And let's say, <clears throat> let's say you decided to apply to Harvard or Stanford or something like that. I don't know, there may be maybe 10 other students from Afghanistan who happen to be applying on that in that year, but probably not many. And so your country is such a unique case that, you know, the stories you can tell, nobody can tell. The stories, you know, your life experience will be very different from everybody else's. And so they may not care about your education per se, but they have a bunch of rich kids who come from very, you know, affluent families in the United States, and they know those kids will benefit from interacting with you. And so they may not care about you, Bakhtash, but they care about those kids who pay $80,000 a year and then will give them millions of dollars in donations talking to you. So they want you on campus for their sake, not for your sake. So they want them to be exposed to all kinds of different people. And so they're looking, oh, this Bakhtash, let's get him on campus. And maybe there is this kid from Australia and maybe there is this kid from Ukraine. We want them to be around so that our main sort of audience, people with a lot of money who pay a lot of money so that they have a very productive, fulfilling, developmental eye-opening for years. And so they want you on campus so that you enrich their lives, so to speak. And so from that perspective, you are unique. So you are almost better off like, you know, they'll probably get thousands of people applying from Germany and from Canada and, you know, tens of thousands from the United States, but they may have only like five or 10 people from Afghanistan, let alone, you know, you have some interesting stories of your own that most Afghani kids don't have. Like you can talk about your exculture ex experience. You can talk about your experience of escape in Afghanistan when, you know, Taliban was taken over the country. I mean, this is a unique, interesting story. And so you will be of interest to them because you will improve chances of success in life of, of all the other students that you will be interacting with. And that's what they want. So they want that diversity. And that's why often, you know, being different, being unique, being, you know, having something interesting in your life story makes you an attractive candidate because they want the campus, the environment to be this interesting. And so how do they select those people? 
Um, in fact, Bakhtas, let me ask you this. Okay, this is a serious, extremely important question. So imagine that you are in the admissions of you know office of the of the university, and you need to predict, you need to predict who's going to be uh, sort of successful in life, and so you get ten thousand applications. Which you know which students would you you Bakhtas, you know looking at all those applications, what would you look at to determine who's going to be successful in life? What would you you look at as you are trying to select people who will become successful, so successful that that success will sort of rub on the university reputation, you know, sort of will will make the university look, you know, uh, effective. Uh, who would be the people, based on your prediction, who will have so much money that they will make donations? Who are the people whose presence on campus enriches everybody else's uh, life? Uh, so can you can you tell me your sort of predictions here? And um, just one second. Um, so um, I wouldn't solely focus on grades because. So what what would be your answer? Uh, um, well, first I wouldn't solely focus on grades because, well, here's the thing: getting good grades in school it's easy because it's kind it's given to us. Well, easy is a <laughs> it's not easy, yeah. but you're right. It's you know yes, it's uh it's like the predictable. You, you do all the readings, you do all the homework. As long as you have brains, you'll probably get it worked out. Yeah, so yes, okay, okay, go on. The material is given to us. There's a teacher that explains everything. And it's like taking a train that takes us to where we want. Yeah, but as long as you do, I, as long as you walk the walk, you'll get the good grades, right? Yeah, but what really matters out there in real life is how people function uh, under pressure, how they kind of work for their goals, how they take responsibility for their goals, how they figure out things, how they how they uh, solve problems without being given material materials and textbooks and stuff. So that's very important. But at the same time, it's important to have someone that knows the value of education and actually knows what he or she is doing with that education. And it's not just but, a diploma. Or a piece of let, me, let, me, let me correct you here. So what you're saying is all correct, but that's sort of what you want. So let me rephrase the question. So how would you select people with all of the things that you just said? How would you select the people who do, as you said, you know, leadership and know what they're doing and know why they're doing it? Like you have an application. You have the standard thing. So what would you be looking at in that stuff that indicates all the qualities that you just listed? Um, extracurricular, extracurricular activities. Uh, that's, because that's, that's exactly what we're getting. So you, you are correct. So as long as you understand how the university thinks, you kind of increase your chances. So the truth is that, yeah, so they know that grades alone don't really predict anything. So there are many people who had good grades and didn't amount to anything in life. They know that uh, you know simply getting very high you know standardized test scores. You can be super bright, but maybe you're lazy. Maybe you're not you know driven, motivated, and so that's why. By the way, there is now a big scandal going on in the United States uh, where, um, um, in fact, yeah. Let, let me talk about it you know for a minute. So because again, it's important uh, for other people to understand. So there is the scandal going on in the United States where some Asian families, like Chinese or uh, Koreans. Uh, sued some of the Ivy League schools like Harvard for discrimination. And so the story goes that um, sort of the, the, the situation is such in the United States that some Asian kids show excellent, excellent uh, results academically. They get like highest grades. Uh, they get uh, the highest um um, uh, standardized test scores. Uh, so they basically, you know, got it all when it comes to academic achievement. In addition, they usually play a musical instrument and, you know, did all the, you know, summer research camps and stuff like that. And so uh, they would apply to those top universities and get rejected. And then they look at who got accepted and they see that there may be some kids who didn't have such high grades who didn't do so well on standardized tests, who didn't do those summer research camps and they still got accepted. 
And so several or many families, uh, in this particular case, it was just happened to be that it was sort of Asian families and many Asian cultures value education a lot. So they sort of, you know, drill their kids, you know, they, they make sure that the kids get the best grades from, from the beginning. And so they say, it's not fair, you know, look at the numbers. My kid is stronger than many students you apply, you know, you accept it. So why? That's discrimination. And so the university's response is one, they say, we are looking for so-called rounded people. So it's not all about grades. We did our research and we found that the numbers alone do not predict success in life. And yeah, you have good grades, you have good scores, but our studies show that it doesn't guarantee that you will be sort of successful in life. So we look people with more sort of rounded achievements. So not only in school, but also outside school, not only academically, but also in other areas. Plus, by the way, they also said, um, and, and again, it's important to take that into account. They said, remember, like I told you, they want you on campus because you are sort of unique because part of the education is talking to people who are different from you, understanding that you know not everyone comes from the same sort of type of background. It used to be that most of the students at top universities were, you know, like from rich families. Many of them were just boys, you know, men, and uh, most of them come, you know, like their parents went to these schools. Uh, they live in these more, you know, like affluent neighborhoods and stuff like that. And so they say, no, 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 education is about being exposed to maybe some kids from poor families, maybe to some kids of different ethnic origin, different cultures, different races, different whatever. And they said, if we simply went based on SAT scores, then, you know, uh, given the great success and admirable success, to be honest, admirable success of, for example, Asian Americans, uh, you know, whose parents ensure that the kids study well and get the good grades, they say, well, we would end up with a campus full of, you know, Chinese, South Korean, and whatever other, you know, nationalities, and there will be not enough diversity. And so that's why, yes, maybe we'll want to take some kids from, I don't know, maybe some Latinos and African Americans who usually don't go to these schools. Yes, their scores may not be as high, but we want them on campus for the sake of all the other kids so that they see that the world is more diverse than whatever, you know, uh, people kind of go in your circles. And so that's why sometimes we have to take people with weaker academic achievements, but different backgrounds so that we have that diversity on campus because it is part of education. If we take everyone from, you know, like rich families uh, whose parents went to, you know, Ivy League schools and whose parents are all sort of, you know, affluent, um, you know, professionals, then it will not be the same education. Yeah, we can still teach you physics and business and whatever else, but you will not have that sort of other aspect of education on campus. And so therefore, yes, just like you said, grades are not enough and they know it. And so therefore they look for other interesting things in your record that tell that uh, in addition to being a good student, you have a chance of becoming a successful leader a business owner, politician, community uh, leader, social movement leader, whatever that might be, you know, maybe artist, maybe, you know, things like that. And so grades don't tell you the whole story. So the only places where you can tell that story would be your essay and maybe your recommendations. And so that's where you want to show. And by the way, again, if you're applying this year, it's almost too late if you don't have any other achievements. If you happen to be the kid who just went to school, got good grades, and that's it, then that, you know, bad luck. I mean, you know, I guess you can still be interesting to many universities, but, you know, you will not impress them much enough. So you want to spend several years of your school life before you apply doing those other things, because both you want to signal to the university that you, you are capable of more than just getting good grades, but also as you do it, you gain that experience. I mean, uh, you know, again, in all honesty, we know that now there are companies and books that will coach you how to improve your resume. They say, okay, well, start some bogus club on campus so that you can say that you were a club founder and club leader, and then go to some, I don't know, political rallies or, or protests so that you can say that you were, you know, socially or politically active. And many people do it just for the check mark. So they kind of pretend to care and they just, you know, parents literally hire coaches who look at you and they say, okay, well, let's do this, 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 so that your resume looks like you've done many things. And that's very sad because many people sort of, they know how the game works and they try to game it. And so they they try to join a club just so that they have the check mark. Check mark. They try to get on a, you know, like a sports team so that they can say that they are, you know, playing sports. But uh, 
if you do it for real, it actually teaches you a lot. If you join a club, you meet new people. If you join a sports, you know, team, you go to competitions, it teaches you some discipline, you know, some things that will help you in life. If you start a club, again, you have to deal with a bunch of things, you know, being a club founder. And so that's a useful experience. And so in any case, you want to tell those stories. And so I've seen many uh, application essays and um, those who got into top schools or, or just good schools, usually like they don't really care. Like if, if in your resume or in your um, essay, you will say that um, I am John Smith and uh, I went to the school and I got good grades. And at your school, I want to study engineering or I want to study whatever you want to study. And so take me because, uh, you know, I'm a good student. They will not be impressed. I've seen you know, winning, winning essays usually tell an interesting life story. So they usually tell, as I said, that you are different, unique, and talking to you, interacting with you for other students will be beneficial. But also you want to weave in things that say, and because of that, I have these great life, you know, aspirations. And because of my experiences, I'm a well positioned, you know, I'm well positioned to to achieve those things in life. And so, yeah, I've seen stories that have nothing to do with academics. I've seen, you know, uh, winning um, essays where they just talk about some, you know, challenges in life. Maybe, you know, like, and I'm not kidding you, like, literally, I've seen people who got into Ivy school that they say I had abusive parents and my dad would drink and my mom would beat me up. And I would have to sneak out of the house, you know, just to study somewhere because in the house it was so bad that I couldn't even study. And I don't even know if those stories are true, to be honest. I mean, some of them, you know, like uh, tear jerking, as they say, you know, kind of make you almost cry. And, you know, it's a nice story. You can make, you know, like write a book or make a movie and everybody will be, oh, poor you, you know, and look, you overcame adversity and, uh, you know, you apply to these top schools. And despite all those challenges in your life, you know, hardship, you know, poor, uh, bad environment, maybe some abuse, maybe some something, you're still asp aspiring more. And so let's take, you know, you are so, you know, they, they seem to like those stories. But sometimes I've seen also like, you know, I'm applying from the, I don't know, from, uh, from the, you know, I don't know, um, fr from, from the military barracks somewhere near Fallujah, as I am, you know, stationed there with my Marine Corps and, you know, and again, that also sounds cool, you know, so here you have this brave sol soldier who is who knows where and who knows why, but he is presumably, you know, defending the country and freedom and whatever, and, you know, and still wants to study at the best school. Or I've seen stories, you know, like, for example, I started 10 businesses, all 10 failed, and I never made any money, but here is what I learned. And so I'm going to keep trying. So, you know, they want those stories like this. So they want, you know, something unusual in their lives and usually something that, you know, that taught you something or that um, you showed, you know, perseverance and dedication and, you know, despite everything was against you, but you still went to your goal and you still achieved something or showed something, or maybe, you know, I was an Olympian and I broke my leg and I didn't think I would go to the Olympics, but then, you know, um, through the miracles of the modern medicine and my will to succeed and my heart training, I still succeeded. Like those are the kinds of stories they want. So um, uh, in your case, Baktash, I would literally tell you life stories. So your life story is interesting. Like I remember that, uh, you know, ex culture meetings where you would, you know, uh, be sort of, uh, you know, connecting with us and then the electricity goes off, you have a blackout, you disconnect, then you reconnect from your phone. Like, you know, at least to me, you showed that despite all these many things that were stacked up against you from the politics and, uh, you know, sort of messed up situation in your country, to simply technical problems that, you know, most kids don't have to deal with. Like in your case, you know, that was a challenge, you know, staying online and doing the work you did and you persevered, you, you, you know, you showed that you can do it. And so well, from that perspective, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, but in my case, this is the thing. I have a lot of stories and when it comes to uh, personal essays, the, they kind of have a, a word limit of, Three hundred. No, yeah, you, you choose you choose one story, you choose one story or one aspect, and you talk about that. So you don't have to write an autobiography. You you talk actually, about you know yeah. So just to be where I am, I I had to go through several countries, and you know my family's life literally was in danger several times. And yeah, if you've seen the movie Kite Runner, by the way, have you seen the movie Kite Runner? I have actually read the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the story. So like I literally had to go through some of these things, you know, and, you know, run for my dear life. And, 
you know, not only geographically had to cover thousands of miles and still my life is sort of, you know, up in the air. I don't know where I'll end up in the next several, you know, I'm still, you know, my status is, you know, semi-determined my, uh, you know, yeah. But in addition, uh, you know, literally a few times it was, it was a close call. And so we had to make some tough choice, like just tell that story. And I think in your specific case, it would be, it would be precisely the kind of type of story that, you know, attracts attention. For other kids, again, it depends. Um, as I said, I almost sometimes feel that, um, like, you know, some people hire professionals. Again, it's unethical, it's wrong. I think that's what's wrong with the education system in the United States. But the truth is that many families hire professionals who sort of write that essay for you. And so they would look and, and often stretch the, the truth and, you know, sort of, as I said, uh, overstate the adversity and, uh, you know, take like little thing that you did, like some sort of like club at school that really like there were three people in that club and the club met five times and maybe two times. But they would talk about that as if, you know, you were like a leader of a major social movement. So that's also, you know, happens in the university going through thousands of applications that don't always have to, you know, it means to verify it. But again, there are many kids who do have those interesting stories, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be sort of war or politics or, you know, geopolitics or things like that. But, uh, you know, there may be something interesting in your life that makes you unique. And in a way that's, you know, finding those things and telling those stories. But again, you sort of want to show uh, that you will be successful in life. You, you already faced enough challenges, but you 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 went through. And so that's where you want to have all those extracurricular activities. If you have some achievements, uh, competitions won, awards received, uh, businesses or, or, or movements started, that's what you want to sort of mention. And again, it doesn't have to be you know, a list of everything. It's better to select one specific aspect and talk about that specific aspect and nothing else. And so they're not necessarily want to be convinced how great a student or leader you are. So as I said, this is almost a competition in writing as it is, you know, sort of an ability or opportunity to talk about yourself. So therefore, you know, this essay thing, you can find a lot of guides online how to do it. As I said, some people hire professionals to help with this, but uh, that's something you definitely want to allocate a lot of time to uh, because, you know, this is probably the only place in the application where you can explain why you're unique, different and interesting and why they should take you. Because everything else, it will be more like, you know, grades good enough, check, SAT good enough, check, whatever else. But this is one that they will read more carefully and make sure that you are sort of, you know, interesting. So for some people like you, Baktash, I think you have enough interesting stuff. So you don't have to worry and you just sit down and write it up and then polish it a little bit. Uh, for most kids who just went to school, got good grades, uh, well, then tough luck. You need to think about what makes you unique, what makes you interesting. Um, and, and some people may not even be unique and interesting. So in that case, yeah, they would have a very low chance of getting accepted to the school. So here, you know, here it would be, you know, unless some things will be made up, I guess, which is unethical, but, you know, some people do that. So some people, you know, invent bogus sports achievements or maybe, you know, science achievements or stuff like that. And as I said, most of them uh, work on it for the last several years before applying, not only trying to have a perfect application, but, you know, populate the resume with these kinds of achievements and extracurricular activities so you can talk about it. And, um, you know, so that's why some applications look so good and often do not represent a real person. So, um, yeah, then basically that's where we are. Um, so if you understand this, that's how you then shape your application essays and th things like that. And then obviously there will be some um, uh, essays that are university specific. And again, sometimes the question will be more like, tell us about yourself, or if you had to introduce yourself, how would you introduce yourself? Or what would your friends tell about you? But sometimes and often they say, so why are you applying specifically to our university? In which case, obviously you'll have to do some research and explain why you think you know, Brown, or Harvard, or Yale, or or again, I, I, you know, it's important to not apply only to those top schools. You want to also have some 
so they have like reach schools that's you know the, the ones that you really want to get into but you kind of realize that it would be very very low chance and then you have your major schools you know those that you have a reasonably good chance and you would be very happy to go to them but you always want to have what we call a backup school you know schools that you're almost guaranteed to be accepted into and that you would still be happy with but you know much less selective and so uh, they will ask you, so why do you want to go to Brown or North Carolina or Wisconsin or DePaul or whatever else you're applying? And you have to say, well, you know what? Yeah, like you have this specific professor I want to work with, or you have this specific program that I like, or maybe you are in the area, like maybe you are in Chicago and I know that Chicago is home to many, I don't know, think tanks and businesses and I want to associate or, you know, uh, do something <laughs> sorry do something with them while i study or maybe i want to be in a major city because i think you know education is as much as you know about exposed to all these you know city things that i wouldn't get and you know like for example maybe um you know a university in in a smaller town like duke for example is in uh durham but it's kind of secluded far far away from like real civilization so to speak or ithaca in uh cornell you know like so it's again not a major city or maybe vice versa maybe you specifically want to be in a smaller town so you want to focus on your education you don't want the distractions of the big city and so that's why you're applying to one of those you know sort of college towns and so so whatever the reasons might be you kind of want to show them that at least you did your research and you are not applying everywhere and you know in reality you are applying everywhere in reality almost everyone applies to like 10 maybe even 20 30 schools and so in reality they don't really care which one they go to as long as it's a good university so you apply everywhere and then wait and see who accepts you but in those specialized essays you want to say that uh, yes, I'm applying to multiple schools, but I'm particularly interested in yours because my parents went to your school or you have this specific program or you're known for your strong program for I don't know, chemistry or political science. Uh, or, you know, like in your case, maybe you're going to Harvard and you specifically want to be at the Kennedy School of what is it, public uh, public affairs or whatever it's called, uh, basically politics, politics. And so I want to become the uh, I know, president of Afghanistan one day, and I want to, you know, lead Afghanistan to a, you know, bright future. And what better place to get education than the Kennedy School of Public Affairs or, you know, at Harvard. So school that, you know, uh, is, is basically alma mater to like a dozen presidents or probably more than that. So, well, I mean, they kind of know that that's why you're applying, but you want to signal that you know those things or whatever else, you know. Maybe as a kid, you read a book and there was a main character who went to that school and you ever since you wanted to specifically go to, I don't know, California, uh, Caltech, uh, California Institute of Technology, because you watch Big Bang and, you know, that's where uh, Sheldon and uh, Leonard work and you, you specifically want to be at Caltech or whatever else it is. So you want to be prepared and, you know, you probably want to spend weeks and weeks thinking about that specifically. Um now, important, um, one more thing, I don't have a slide, so I'll just talk about it. So when to apply. There are sort of three waves uh, or three deadlines that you want to, or that you need to know about existence. So um, uh, there is a, um, so the process starts sometime in sort of like, you can start applying probably in the summer, but usually it hits up like September, October. And the first wave of deadlines are so-called early decision and early action. So uh, the real deadlines will be towards the end of the year. So usually it would be like in November, December for foreigners, for some schools to even be in the spring. Uh, I've seen like, for example, University of Texas at Dallas, I think they even accept applications until like May, which is unusual. So almost all of them will be in November or December, like literally right around now and for the next month, that's the regular uh, deadline. So like mid-November to mid-December, that's usually the normal deadline for most universities. That's sort of the regular deadline. And so if this year you, you literally have only a few weeks left to apply through the regular decision. Um, there is also something called early action and early decision, and those tend to be earlier, like usually October plus or minus 15, or maybe even earlier. And so early decision, that's a um, legally binding application deadline where you apply and you say, I'm applying to your university and only your university. And if you accept me, I guarantee that I will go to your school. So I will not apply anywhere else. And as long as you accept me, 
I will come to your school regardless of the conditions, stipend or no stipend. And so uh, many kids apply like in September or maybe October, let's say to a top university like Harvard or whatever other school is. So usually that's the elite schools that have those early decision and it is a contract. So if they accept you and you don't come, they can literally sue you and you still have to pay them something like it's, it's legally binding as they call it. But at the same time, it sort of improved the chances of being accepted because you essentially say, I'm so interested in your school that I'm willing not to apply anywhere else. And if you accept me, I will come to your school no matter what, what it costs me. And so this sort of look at your application more favorably. And so for this year, we missed already that wave. I don't think anybody else has the early decision at this time, but uh, you know some of them have it. And so sometimes, not sometimes, but even if you're not accepted, what they will say is that we didn't accept you based on the early decision deadline, but we put your application in the general pool and we will consider you with regular application. Then there is this early action <clears throat> where you apply early. It's not legally binding. You can still apply sometimes to multiple schools, but essentially they allow you to apply earlier and you kind of declare and say, I am so interested in your school that I'm not even waiting for the general deadline. I'm applying early. And so basically I wanna know if you take me and if you take me, I probably will not be even applying anywhere else. So I'm kind of so interested that I'm you know, applying a little earlier. And so again, for the school, it tells that you are proactive, that you are better organized, that you applied early and that you are probably interested enough in their school to make this early step and everybody else is your backup. So you're interested in this school. Again, I'm not sure how much it improves your chances, but you probably wanna be in that pool at least for the school you're interested in. So the good news here is again, that if they accept you, you can still say no. You say, well, thank you very much, but I applied to several early action sort of applications and, you know, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll choose a different one. And then finally, you have the regular uh, deadline. <clears throat> As I said, for most of the schools, it would be uh, somewhere between November 15 and maybe December 31 or December something. But there are enough schools that have a later deadline. So some would say you can still apply in January and February. And as I said, I've seen some good schools that accept applications all the way to, till May. Few, not many. Most of them will be done within the next four weeks. But there will be some that will allow you to apply a little bit later. And so uh, those are, uh, you know, uh, you, this year you can still apply to those schools. And so um, that's the process. <clears throat> and so um, when it comes to applying, let me see if I can quickly find it. So uh, let me see if I can uh, find this uh, common app. But there is something called common app. So let me share the screen and I'll, I, I hope I still have access. So when my son was applying, so this is the common app. And so you create your profile in Common App. It doesn't call, uh, doesn't cost anything. It looks like a uh, member college login. It may have erased it since the last year. Let me see. So I think this is my son's application if I have it. Yeah, it, it seems like it may be outdated because it doesn't seem to be working anymore. Let me see. I think I may have my own. No, yeah, it looks like it, it's 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 outdated. Uh, so I cannot go in and show you, but essentially what it is, you have this common app website, website, and so you log in, and then you will see. Yeah, I don't know why it's not working. I really wanted to show you what it looks like, but I think once the cycle is over, I guess you need to create a new account, unless my son changed the password as he was applying. So, uh, but in any case. This is where you submit all your main documents. Uh, so it's it's for the United States and for some American schools, but not all universities in the United States and not all in Canada. Most Canadian universities have their own system and many American universities have their own system. But in Common App, you create your profile for free. So this is where you will <clears throat> provide all your bio, you know um, demographic information. This is where you will provide your Common App uh, essay. This is where you upload your transcripts and recommendations. So this is where like 80%, 90% of all your documents will be stored. And then this is where you will see the list of universities that um, use Common App for their application, which in the United States, it looks like it's almost all universities, like maybe 80, 90, 90% of universities. Like that's definitely where you'll have Harvard, Stanford, Yale, you know, like whatever, North Carolina and so on. There will be some schools that for some reason don't use Common App. And I'm not sure what's the reason if they believe that there is something better out there or it just costs a lot of money for them. <clears throat> but the vast, vast majority of the schools will be here. And so once you created your profile, 
this is where you will literally just, you know, find universities where you want to apply. Like you put University of North Carolina and just click on it. It will show you when the deadline is, what documents they need. And usually you will have all of the documents already there and you say apply here. And then a window will pop up and say, okay, well, the application fee is like $60 here. And so, and then again, if you want a, an application fee waiver, <clears throat> you have to go through the process. By the way, sometimes schools, if you apply before a certain deadline, they will say it's a free application until this time, and then you pay this much after this deadline. So that's another sort of thing where you can save money, but in some cases you can ask for the waiver. But in any case, once your main application is done, then you just say, okay, I want to apply to this school, this school, this school, this school. So you kind of start typing the name of the school, the name pops up and you click. And so you still have to pay each time for each separately, but at least you don't have to submit the documents each time separately. So it just takes the documents from this main server and sends it to all the schools that you identified. In most cases, as I said, the school will have some local requirements, like usually a couple more essays that you need to write. Sometimes maybe asking for some additional documents, but most of the time, what you have in common app, you just say, okay, I want to apply to these 10 schools. And basically by selecting them, you kind of have everything in place. You just pay the fee and usually have a couple of short, you know, essays to write, you know, like why my school specifically, or maybe do you want to start or live on campus or off campus and why, you know, things like that. And so that's basically, you know, uh, for the process. For the professors, again, we used to write uh, separate letters for each university where students apply. Now, luckily I just write one, and then wherever student applies, my recommendation letter goes to all those schools automatically. So I don't have to write separate letters. Sometimes, as I said, some schools have their own system, especially in Canada or Australia or Canada, I mean, or uh, New Zealand. Some of them still use Common App, but most of the time they have their own stuff. Like in Canada, it's usually not even at the university level, but it's the, at the province level. Like universities in Ontario use the Ontario application portal. In British Columbia, they use British Columbia application portal, and some of them they have their they have their own uh, sort of portal where you just go to the university. But so uh, Common App makes it much easier because it takes days to get all those documents in, and so if you go through the Common App, it saves you time and um, sort of you know makes it easy to apply to additional schools. So that's that's one of those things. So any questions about the process of application? Because I'm almost done with, with this aspect. And so I just wanted to show you a couple more little things that may increase your chances, but overall I'm almost done. Um, no, I don't have a question. Okay, so then let me show you a couple more things that sometimes people, I'm not sure if it would apply to you, but you know, might be of interest to some people. So as I said, um, in the United States, the process of applying to universities has become so competitive and so complicated and so sort of important for your life's career, you know, like what school you go to determines sort of what you can and cannot do in life, so to speak. I mean, ultimately it's all about, you know, you, but the truth is that if you graduate from a prestigious school, you are positioned much better for success and vice versa. If you don't graduate from one of these prestigious schools, it will be much harder for you to have sort of, you know, a remarkably successful life. And so uh, there is a whole industry out there that helps you sort of apply into top schools from some unethical institutions. And again, we've had a lot of scandals lately where some of these uh, companies, uh, you know, like literally break the law to help uh, kids from rich families get into top schools where they would fake sports achievements, where they would fake all kinds of things and sometimes bribe, like literally pay bribes to the universities to, to get those kids in. So you don't want to work with those because, you know, they can go to prison and you can go to prison for, you know, breaking the law. But there are many that sort of operate legally. So they, you know, they will appoint a coach who will work with you, who will review your record and tell you, which things you want to highlight, which things will impress the school, who will uh, review your record, identify, gap, identify gaps, you know, things that you, you know, where you are not very good. And then if you hire them early enough, they will even help you improve those things. Like if you don't have enough extracurricular activities, they will suggest some things you can do. If you don't have a uh, high enough GPA, they will, you know, help you find tutors who will help you improve GPA, you know, things like that. And so you can try that as well. Uh, so usually it costs a lot of money, depending on the level of sort of help. So some of them only help with the application process and they cost, I don't know, 
can be from anywhere a few hundred to a few thousand dollars. The sort of the high end uh, will cost you tens of thousands of dollars, but they will, you know, sort of work with you extremely closely and professionals like a team of professionals will be buffing up your sort of, uh, you know, record to make you more attractive. And some, as I said, will even schedule interviews on your behalf with the university so that you, you know, sort of improve your chances every possible way. <clears throat> Obviously, if a family has money to hire professionals, yeah, sure, go ahead. I think it will help. It saves time. They know all the tricks. They know uh, all about available stipends. Uh, it may be totally worth the money. But then again, it costs money. And then, uh, I don't know, if you're a good student, maybe you don't even need them. So, I mean, it's not that difficult to begin with. So, I mean, yeah, it will take some time, but, you know, you can totally do it yourself. So, but anyway, if you have the money, I guess it would make sense to hire professionals. Uh, so, and it doesn't have to be one of these super rich professional companies. It could be someone, you know, like whose kids have gone through the process and who's willing to help, or maybe someone who is an educator, a professor at, you know, in this system, and they know how the system works. So that can be extremely helpful as well. But I guess if you have a strong record, you probably don't need them, but you can, I don't know, it, it can be a little bit tricky. So yeah, um, <clears throat> sort of, you know, that's one of the decisions you'll have to make. So um, optimal strategy, I almost wish we talked with you about this a year ago, or maybe even more, but we kind of have. So you kind of have, have been, you know, we've been working with you for a while. But uh, so if you're applying for this cycle for the next fall, <clears throat> it's too late for us to make any changes in your uh, record. We'll have to go with what you have. So whatever GPA, whatever test course uh, you have, it's too late to improve those. Um, so all you have to do is just, you know, take tests if needed right now, uh, start writing those essays right now. I guess you can produce a decent essay in a few days, better a few weeks, but you still have a few weeks. Uh, see if they need uh, like TOEFL. Uh, if you are a foreign speaker, language speaker, obviously you'll have that. So it's possible to get everything done in a few weeks. It's not too late for this semester. I mean, for this cycle, you still have a few weeks before the deadline. Some schools have a few months. So you are in a good, you know, in a good shape to get everything done if you focus and work hard for the next few weeks. In the ideal scenario, you want to start like two years in advance and you want to, you know, uh, get some books or online tutorials for preparing for the SAT or CAT. You want to drill, drill, drill to get the best possible help. Maybe even enroll in online or face-to-face -face prep courses to get those scores up. You want to focus on your S, I mean, on your GPA in school. So you want to make sure that your GPA is great by the time you will be applying. You want to volunteer at research labs, work with local professors, uh, attend summer camps, take online courses. So whatever all those extracurricular things you can do, you have time. Like even if you haven't done anything yet, if you have a year or two, you can start doing those things now. So you have it in your resume. So that's, you know, like start, start working on that stuff now. Then uh, closer to like, so applications would be right around now. So Basically, for those who are applying next year, around now, maybe in a few months, start looking at the specific universities. So select like four or five top schools that you want to go to, but also select like 10, 15, 20 good schools, you know, the ones that you would be very happy to go to, uh, but perhaps are not super elite. And then maybe select another like four or five, maybe more uh, backup schools, like that you're not particularly interested in, that you but you would be happy with in case all the other ones will not take you. And so uh, maybe select some in the United States, maybe some in Canada, maybe some backups in the EU. The good thing is that in Canada, often the deadline's a little bit later, like maybe a few weeks later. And in Europe, it's usually spring, so you have time. And so you can maybe even go ahead and apply in the United States uh, for the you know like deadlines, October, November, December. But then you will probably hear back like February, maybe March. And if it's all no, 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 then you still have time to apply to some European schools. So you don't have to apply right away, but you can see how things go with American schools, Canadian schools. And if it's not very good, you still have time to get, you know, applications into some European or Australian schools. And then, as I said, you know, like four months before this, this you know, the school year starts, if, if you see that it's not working very well, if you're getting more rejections, then maybe you should start applying for some lower tier schools that are still accepting applications. Um, that's basically it. So um, I don't think I have anything else to say. So I know that it's a lot and I know it's hard to process, 
but um, it will take time. But it's not too late for this reason for this cycle. Those who would like to apply next year, you have all the time, and just be prepared to spend. I'd say probably like a hundred hours, maybe two hundred hours, going through the whole process. And you know, if you're in a hurry, you can pack it into a few weeks now. If you are, uh, you know, not in a hurry, then yeah, plan to spend a few a few hours, maybe every day or a few hours every week over the next whatever you know year or two, whatever time you have. And um, if you if you kind of do it methodologically and uh, you know uh, in a disciplined way, you can greatly improve your chances. <clears throat> but that that's that's basically how it works. So, any any questions overall? Um, no, I th I think I have all the answers. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So it was a long, long discussion. So um, yeah, if questions arise, let me know. Uh, I can definitely help you with the recommendations. Once you have your essay, I will be happy to take a look at it and provide some comments and you know basically critique it. And so um, ideally, you want to send it to several people to get their input, uh, to hear their thoughts, and then you know rewrite it a few times, polish it a little bit. Um, it will take a long time to collect all the documents. It's it's a lot of papers, and as you correctly pointed out, some things it's not just click and submit. So it may take a long time just to obtain the document, but you know that's part of the game. So in a way, the selection process or application process, you know, tests how organized and dedicated you are because it takes much time. And some people will start and then never finish, and they will say, "Ah, screw it, it's too much work. I don't know how to do it." I, I, you know. And those who do apply, at the very least, it means that they were sort of interested enough to endure all these 100, 200 hours of, you know, application process. Well, maybe they'll also show up for classes on time and become, you know, something in this life. Uh, the good part is that I, I, I'm actually graduated, so I have my grades, I have the diploma, yeah. I have it stamped and everything. I have taken uh, English proficiency test. Yeah. I have... Um, I have one essay written, but I'm going to bring some changes to it and add a couple of things that uh, has happened in the last couple of months. And uh, I, I, I have a lot of things. I just need to already organize them. Yeah. Even better, even better. Then, yes, in your case, it's more about putting it all together and polishing it a little bit. But it sounds like you're well positioned. And so if you're applying this year, you still have some time. And it sounds like it shouldn't be a huge problem for you to prepare everything. So um, it may be difficult if the person is full-time in school still and maybe has a job as many kids in the United States do, uh, you know, and if parents are busy and can't help much, uh, then yes, it's, it's, it's a process. But if you can dedicate all your time to the application process, totally doable in a few hard, but, you know, doable days, weeks, maybe. So um, should be should be still not too late. Okay, well, good luck. So if, as, as questions arise, let me know and um, we'll, we'll make it work. Okay, so, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Good luck. Bye-bye.